for those who are listening to the scripture reading and saying Christmas passages are a strange selection for Father's Day. They weren't Christmas passages, they were Joseph passages. Those were all the passages that told us about Joseph. And Joseph may have been the greatest father in the Bible. There's an old movie entitled, Who Will Love My Children? You might be able to find it on Lifetime. It's about a family with a husband and wife and five kids. And the wife gets deathly ill. The doctors give her only a year to live. And as most movies on Lifetime, she looks to her husband and considers him a loser and determines that he cannot carry on after she is gone. So she puts an ad in the paper and starts interviewing parents for who will take care of her children. And the movie continues like that with, with heart-wrenching you know, emotion attached to it. And if you think a little bit about God, he's going to send his son to earth, and who's going to love his son when he is a baby? We focus on Mary. Seems that Mary was an easy choice. She was devout and faithful, and when the angel showed up, she said, okay, and carried Jesus for nine months, but we overlook Joseph who was there all along. God chose both a mother and father for Jesus. He did not choose a single mother. Uh, Mary was Mary. When it started out, they were betrothed, they were engaged. We don't know if it was an arranged marriage or not. But they were promised to each other. And when the angel showed up to Mary, Joseph didn't know anything about it. Mary gets pregnant. Now, consider this. Two high school kids, because that's about how old these people were. And their senior year, they're dating, and they're talking about all these great plans, and they're going to go to college together, and they're going to do this, and they're going to do that. And then one day, girl shows up and she says, I am pregnant. And he knows it's not him. And so he believes that she's been messing around, fooling around. And the, the rules back then was that uh, he could drag her into the public square, accuse her of adultery, uh, and have her stoned. That was the rules back then because it was clearly adultery. Uh, but he didn't do that. God chose somebody with character. God chose somebody who was a good man. Because Jesus needed a father while growing up. The value of fatherhood today is uh, underrated. There is a big movement to uh, single parenthood. Seems to be very popular. And the main reason, the majority of times, is the father who runs away from the mother and kids. Now, let me say very clearly that if uh, you know a single mother, if you are a single mother, that is a heroic task. It's tough to do. But it isn't God's design, and it isn't the best throughout history. Fathers in the home have always been a better choice in raising the kids. And you go back 2,000 years ago, the whole concept of a single mother was unknown. If a woman got pregnant and the father got killed in battle or in an accident, the young woman with the child would move back into the parent's house until they could find a man to marry her and, and keep things going. The idea of a woman living alone and raising a child is an unknown idea. Uh, they just didn't do that. And so God picked 
a man. And there's three attributes that we are going to look at today in Joseph's life. First, Joseph was a loving man. He loved, first and foremost, Mary. When, Moses, when Joseph got the revelation that his wife was pregnant from Mary, his first thought was, I will divorce her quietly. Won't make a scene, won't tell anybody, just take her back to her parents' house and leave her there, and nobody will have to know about this. He was very concerned about her shame. He was very concerned about her standing in the community. He loved her very much and wanted to do the best thing and protect her at all costs. And you say, well, why didn't he just you know, marry her and keep the baby for himself? That just wasn't done under the Jewish law. You had to do something with a woman who had committed adultery. It was not forgive and forget. He wanted to protect her. He wanted to take care of her. He wanted to put her away secretly because he was involved in what is known as a classic love story. He loved her and wanted to protect her. Secondly, Joseph loved Jesus. And you say, well, we all love Jesus. But this is when Jesus was four days old. He loved Jesus as his own son. There is no evidence, and we look at what the Bible doesn't talk about here, there's no evidence that Joseph rejected his son. There's no evidence that Joseph rejected Jesus. He could have said, fine, I got the message from the angel. Fine, God's talking to me, but this is not my flesh and blood. I'm going to treat him radically different." than the rest of the sons and daughters that I had. And he had multiple other sons and daughters. But he, in essence, adopted Jesus as his own. There is no evidence that he treated Jesus different than James and Jude, his more famous brothers, or anybody else that was in the family. When people today are more apt to advocate their roles as parents because kids get in the way. There can be irreparable damage to the family and to the children. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, But if anybody does not provide for his own, especially those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. The idea in Scripture is that if you have kids, you stick with them, and you take care of them, and you raise them. And Joseph had that view. He was given this child by God, and he was going to raise Jesus as his own. Joseph was also a devout man. First, he was a man who obeyed God. When the angel showed up, he could have ran to the hills. We think that, oh, well, an angel shows up, and we're going to do what the angel says. Trust me, if an angel shows up to you, you're going to be a bit scared as to what's going on and believe that it's some sort of setup that Mary has gotten some of her brothers together and they're doing this scam to make him love this unborn child. But the angel says, name him Jesus. Baby's born, names him Jesus. Angel shows up and says, take him to Egypt. And at this point realize that the angel's not talking to Mary anymore. The angel talked to Mary once, saying you're gonna have a baby, you're gonna name him Jesus. Every time the angel appears after that, the angel is talking to Joseph and telling Joseph what to do. Why? 
because Joseph is the head of the family, because as chauvinistic as it was, back then, the men were the head of the family, and the men made the decisions. And if they're going to move to Egypt, it was the man who was going to make them move to Egypt. That's just the way it was. And so Joseph gets the message, and they move to Egypt, and while in Egypt, he is providing for them somehow. See, women did not work outside the home. The goal of the women back then was to raise the family, run the household, perhaps plant some crops in the backyard, and get food for the family. And it's the husband who went out and worked. And so he's in a strange land. They're speaking common Greek language, but he's trying to find things to build and where he could be a carpenter and be a furniture repair shop anything that he did to keep things going. They just didn't hang out in Egypt. Little Jesus was hungry, and there was more babies on the way, and they had to be fed, and they needed housing, and they needed clothes. That means Joseph had to work. And the angel shows up and says, Herod is dead. You can move back to Israel. And he leaves his established life in Egypt drops everything and moves back to Nazareth and starts all over again because he was a devout man because what God wanted was the most important thing to him. Whatever it took to obey God is what Joseph did. Secondly, he was a man of faith. Uh, he was a man of faith because he didn't know anybody in Egypt, because he'd never been to Nazareth, because everything the angel is telling him to do, he is, in many ways, blindly saying yes and going to do it. There are many people of faith in the Bible, but to take this new treasure that you have been informed is the Son of God, and to put him on the back of the mule and to drag him across country must have been difficult. What's going on? You know, can I do this? But he moved forward. He took the next step. He was a man of faith. Once there was a farmer who had toiled over a bumper crop. It was a badly needed crop. It was a late growing season. And if this didn't come through, they might lose everything. Few days before the harvest, a freak hailstorm came, destroyed everything, flooded the property, and the grain was destroyed. His young son was with him, watching him, and not knowing really how to react. The young son looked to his father, and his father began to softly sing, Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Years later, the boy grew into manhood and would tell his friends that that was the greatest sermon he had ever heard. That at a time of immeasurable catastrophe, his father showed amazing faith. Joseph was a man of great faith. Thirdly, he was a man who was faithful in spiritual duties. In Luke 2.41, there's a story of Jesus, the whole caravan of families go to the temple. Jesus inadvertently gets left behind. They go back and he's questioning the, the scholars and says, of course, I'd be in my father's house, and they marveled at this. There's one little part of that passage that we often overlook, overlook, and it says that Joseph took Jesus to the temple as he did every year. Every year, Joseph would, take, would pack up his family and probably his neighbors and would go to the temple and offer the sacrifices for his family, offer the sacrifices for his kids, show his children this great, amazing temple of the living God, year after year after year. Jesus was left behind when he was 12, 
So they had been there 11 times before, we can estimate. It was probably Joseph's practice to go there every year, even before Jesus was born. Joseph knew what he needed to do, and he did it faithfully. There's a story of a little boy who was playing on Sunday morning while his dad was in the lounge chair reading the paper. Father said, son, get ready. Get ready for Sunday school. The little boy asked, are you coming today, dad? The man replied, no, I'm not coming, but I want you to hurry up and get ready. The little boy said, did you used to go to Sunday school when you were a boy, dad? And he said, I most certainly did. As he walked away, the boy mumbled, yeah, and I bet it won't do me any good either. <laughs> Kids watch their parents. Kids watch their fathers. And the do as I say, don't do as I do attitude doesn't go too far. When people come to this church, when people meet you and know that you're a Christian, the idea that you must act a certain way or be a certain way, a living gospel, as we say, is, is paramount to the Christian witness and to the Christian life. Joseph was a loving man. Joseph was a devout man. Finally, Joseph was a wise man. Joseph was wise because he redeemed the time, you say, huh? After Matthew 3, Joseph disappears. When the brothers and sisters come and try to convince Jesus to come home and stop playing Messiah, it is his brothers and sisters and his mother. Now, in that culture, if the father was alive, the father would be at the front of the line saying, Son, I said, come home. He would make Jesus leave his friends and come home. But he's not there. When Mary is with a group where Jesus is teaching, Joseph is not there. At the cross, Mary is there, and Jesus tells John, to take care of her, he wouldn't do that if Joseph was still alive. That would be very disrespectful if Joseph was still alive. So we don't know what happened to Joseph. We have to believe that it didn't get so hard he just walked away. He doesn't have that track record. We have to believe that it didn't get so bad that he just divorced Mary and went on to, you know, some younger person. He didn't have that track record. So he got killed in some strange carpentry accident. He got sent to war with the, the Romans who were conscripting people all the time. In some way, he was not home. We have to believe that he had been killed because there's no mention of him continuing on. So what did Joseph do in his short time? Well, he raised Jesus into adulthood. Now, would Jesus have turned out all right, even if Joseph wasn't that great? Absolutely. But he raised other boys and other girls, two specifically, James and Jude, the brothers of Jesus, both who wrote books in the New Testament. So Jesus, being the Son of God, may have had a leg up, but James and Jude were just normal folk like you and I. And Joseph taking them to the temple every year, reading from, to them from the Bible, teaching them who God was, gave them such faith that when Jesus revealed himself, his two brothers were able to believe, get saved, and write two books of the New Testament. Joseph wasted no time, as far as we can tell. And we look at how his sons turned out. We look at what James wrote and what Jude wrote. 
And we have to believe that they were raised in a godly family. Two godly sons were raised by Joseph, James, and Jude. And we can read their story in the New Testament. Joseph was not a slacker by any means. He loved Mary with all his heart. And when God gave him a challenge, he stepped up to it in faith and said, I may not understand it. I may not like it. I'm giving up everything I've built and going to a foreign country. Then I'm giving up everything I built in that foreign country and coming back to a different place in Israel. He was a man who loved Mary. He was a devout man. He was an obedient man. He was a godly man. He is quite possibly the greatest father in the Bible. Joseph, the father of Jesus. So what do we do with this? Some of us are fathers. Some of us are not. But the Bible is still clear in 1 Timothy 5.8, which says, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially the member of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. A situation had grown with false teachers in the church of Ephesus, and they punished people who were not like them by withholding food and withholding help. The problem is, some of those people who were not like them might be their brothers and sisters or even their parents. As people split families because of religious differences, they were not willing to go back and make sure that their parents had enough to eat, that their parents had a place to live. And so, Paul is writing to Timothy that if you take your relatives especially those of your household, and don't make sure they have enough to eat, a place to sleep, good clothing, you're actually worse than an unbeliever. But the word provide can be taken a little further. Today it's easier with government programs and stuff. We can take our aged parents and put them in a home. And do things like that. Uh, we can ignore the problems with family members that are around us because there are safety nets. But what if you are withholding affection? Uh, we need to be able to uh, uh, provide love and affection to those that God has put into our family. Joseph had no choice that God was going to put Jesus into his family. And he showered Jesus with affection. He was an example. We can be an example to those in our family who are less involved in the church. If you have a family member that is actually unsaved or part of another religion, we can be respectfully an example of what God offers, of what the New Testament says. We can give godly counsel. It is amazing how often I hear stories of people who work in a company full of non-Christians, but whenever there's a tragedy, they will always come to the Christian and say, what do you think about this? What do I do about this? There is a wisdom in godly counsel that Christians can give that non-Christians do not have access to. We can be laughing and warm. We can be full of laughter and warmth. We can't believe that Joseph's household was a, a seminary. We have to believe that it was a good, honest family that Jesus played like every other kid back in those days. And that Joseph loved his children, loved his wife, that he could laugh with them and he could show them warmth. He was a real person and as Christians, who live in a lost and dying world, we need to be real people. We need to be able to laugh with people and cry with people and empathize with people because that is what Christ does. And lastly, we need to provide loving concern. Uh, it's very easy in a family situation to provide uh, a lecture or a, a 
they rebuke. When things don't go the way we want, it is much better, much more godly to provide loving concern. If we love those in our family, if we love those in this church, then we will be lovingly concerned when things aren't going right, and we will bring those things before God, and we will pray with them, and we will be loving people that show the love of Christ. Joseph seemed to raise up Jesus Christ to be just fine. It says in the Bible that as Jesus grew, he grew in knowledge and stature. Uh, we believe that Jesus set aside some of his deity powers when he came to earth and he had to learn and grow just like the rest of us. And it was Joseph who educated him in that. It was Joseph who gave him the godly education. It was Joseph who took him to the temple every year to experience the truth and the law of God. And it was Joseph who was a loving father that raised godly children that all became saved and followers of Jesus. And we have their record to this day. We thank God for Joseph and we thank God for the godly parents that are in this church. And we thank God for the godly fathers that are all over this country who love their kids, who are raising their kids in truth in the Bible and bringing them to church every week like Joseph took them to the temple every year. We praise God for them. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I thank you for the story of Joseph. I thank you for the um, things that it can show us as to how to live and how to interact with our family. I pray that we will be inspired to love those in our family more, to be truly supportive of those in our family and helping the younger ones to discover what God would have them to do. Lord, I praise you for these things and ask your blessing upon this Father's Day. I ask this through the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen.